Heavenly Father, guide us through your word tonight, Father. Uh, Open our hearts to understand this text. Father Paul is uh, a man who wrote by your inspiration, gave us deep wisdom from your thoughts. Father, he's explaining things that are so important to the life of the body and to our understanding of the future. And yet, Father, even today in the church, there are many who misunderstand what we're reading today. And Father, we know that uh, we, we would only be better than that if you permit. If you open our eyes and ears and you show us the truth, Father, we'll know it. Um, but, Father, I ask you let us uh, get our pride out of the way, get our, our improper notions that we may have been given at some point in the past, and that stands in our way today. Father, please remove those as well. Um, make us uh, equal to the task, Father, of understanding the Word tonight so that we can fully rest in it, fully use it, and and profit by it. And we ask as well, Father, that no matter what we may know or think we know, that you'd guard our hearts against haughtiness, against self-assurance and pride. Father, we just want to be humble in what we learn so that you receive glory both through our words and our actions as a result of what we learn. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Israel's past, Israel's present, and now tonight we cover Israel's future. That's where Paul's been leading us over the course of the past two chapters in Romans. And we've been studying through 9, 10, 11 with an understanding that Paul's answering the question about Israel. He wants to reconcile the truth of a faithful, promise-keeping God with the reality of an unbelieving Israel. There's an answer in here somewhere. It's an answer that's been hidden from the beginning of time. It's an answer we need to understand, but it's an answer that's going to require some careful scholarship, it's going to require an open mind, and it's going to require an appreciation of Israel's history. So Paul addressed the history in chapter 9, and in that examination of history, Paul revealed that God has always dispensed his mercy selectively within the nation of Israel. Some were given his mercy, others were not. So in chapter 9, Paul explained why only some in Israel embraced Messiah When he appeared for them, the answer was the Lord had shifted his mercy away from Israel, from the Jewish nation. He was shifting it toward the Gentile nations at that time. So what chapter 9 taught us is why only some in Israel have received Messiah in the past. Then in chapter 10, Paul addressed Israel's present circumstances. And even today, in our day, Israel remains intently focused on following God, on awaiting their Messiah's arrival. And yet they aren't finding the very thing they're seeking. And they're not finding it because Paul says they continue to seek it with hard hearts. They're intent on obtaining self-righteousness rather than the righteousness that comes by faith. So chapter 10 explains why a zealous nation continues in their unbelief despite the simplicity of God's plan of salvation. And the answer is the Lord in his providence elected to leave Israel in their disobedience for a time so that he may extend mercy to Gentiles. So... If you don't gain those understandings out of 9 and out of 10, you'll have no hope whatsoever to understand 11. Because 11 is built on those first two chapters. These principles of God being selective, of God appointing those for mercy, of God having stepped over his people for a time to appoint mercy to another group of people and onward. And so as we reach chapter 11, there's several more questions that need to be answered regarding God's faithfulness and his plan for Israel, including the most important question of all, which is why. Why is all of this the way God wanted it? And that's where we go tonight. Chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So that's Paul's opening. And he starts with a very logical question, the one he knew that his readers would pose, based on what he'd already taught, which is simply, has God rejected his own people, Israel? That is to say, does Israel's continuing unbelief in our present age 
Does that mean that Israel will never come to faith? That they will never believe in Jesus? In other words, God has cast them aside forever. And this is just now the new normal for Israel. That's the question Paul knew his readers would ask. Certainly the Jewish readers might bring it up in light of what he's taught in chapters 9 and 10. And indeed, many believers throughout the centuries have asked this same question, the one that Paul's writing right now. Some believers, and I would say even entire denominations of Christians today, have answered this question wrongly. This very same question, has God forsaken his people? They have come to the conclusion that God did in fact reject Israel forever. They teach these folks I'm talking about, they teach a wrong view of Israel called replacement theology. That theology holds that Gentile believers in the church, men and women like you and I, have replaced the Jewish people in God's plan. Consequently, they would tell you that the promises God gave to the Jewish people are going to be fulfilled through the church rather than through the literal Israel. And those false conclusions are particularly ironic given Paul's direct answer to his own question in verse 1. Paul says, unambiguously, the Lord will never reject his covenant people. Now, I want you to notice something. This takes us back to chapter 9, and it's incredibly important to understand how we can be so sure that the replacement theology is wrong. Notice that the people in view in verse 1, the ones that Paul says will not be rejected, his people, in other words, are the same people that Paul defined back in chapter 9. In chapter 9, Paul defined this group called God's people as those who are physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom Paul calls Israelites. And in chapter 9, that's Paul's definition, and that definition has never changed, and it takes us all the way into chapter 11. Paul's definition prevents us from shifting our focus to some other group, some so-called spiritual Israel. There's no way you can do that without violating his own definition. Look in verse 1. Paul says clearly, God has not and will not forsake his covenant people Israel. And his best proof to you and I that that's true is himself. Paul says, look at me. And then he describes himself. Now look at his description in comparison to, in relationship with, the same definition he gave back in chapter 9. Look what Paul says of himself. An Israelite a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Here again, these are terms that can only refer to a literal Jew. The same standard of definition that he gave back in chapter 9. In fact, the term Israelite is especially important because it was part of Paul's definition explicitly. He uses the same term back in chapter 9. And he uses it again now to refer to the people that God will not reject. And in the Bible, the term Israelite is only ever used to describe a physical descendant of Jacob. Gentile believers in the church are never called Israelites in the Bible. Only Jews, that is, whether believer or unbeliever, whether Messianic or not, they alone can be considered an Israelite. And so Paul says definitively, that God has not and will not reject his literal, physical descendants from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that rejection, or that definition, completely precludes any interpretation to suggest that, yes, God did reject those physical people because he has another people that will take their place. Paul categorically refutes that thought. If God had rejected his people then there would be no believing people among the Jews at all. That's Paul's argument. Paul says, look at me. He says, I am an Israelite. I am a descendant. But of course, we also know Paul is a believing individual. And so his argument is, my existence proves that God has not forsaken the Jewish people. That argument only makes sense if we understand how people come to salvation, doesn't it? That if someone is believing, it is proof God has appointed them. To believe. And Paul then says, if God appointed me to believe, it is evidence that God has not forsaken the Jewish people because God would not have selected a Jew to receive his mercy if it was in his intention to reject all Jewish people. Therefore, Paul says explicitly, my faith is proof to you that God is not done with the Jewish people, those he says God foreknew. The people God foreknew are these Jews that God had on his mind from the foundation of the earth. These people God foreknew, he predestined to salvation, and those he predestined, he called into faith, preserving a remnant within the larger community of the apostate Israel. 
And Paul says, I'm one of these guys. I'm a member of the Jewish remnant living right here before you. And as such, he says, my continuing existence and others like me is proof God is continuing to be faithful to Israel. Just as God only selected some to believe during Israel's past, like he demonstrated with Jacob versus Esau, similarly, the fact that God has allowed some Jews to believe in this age is proof that he continues to work with a remnant of them today. He is not done with the Jewish people. Now, if God had the intention to do away with his people, to not preserve his nation, then he would never have perpetuated faith among them. He would have withheld his mercy. Faith would have died out. Eventually, the people themselves would have ceased to exist. And if you doubt what I'm saying, consider the history of peoples God has dealt with. He did this. He extinguished the Canaanites. He extinguished the Phoenicians. He extinguished the Philistines. He has said and has actually done this on many occasions. But instead, the people of Israel miraculously live on and have done so over centuries without even a land of their own, defying all human explanations. And among that group, God has continued to preserve a remnant of believing Jews like Paul. So all of that argues for the unmistakable conclusion, God still has a plan for his covenant people. But of course, we're trying to understand what is that plan. Because God has always called just a minority of people into faith. It's been easy for us to sometimes assume that God has turned his back on Israel. That's what Paul deals with next. This idea that because God works in such small corners with a remnant that is relatively small compared to the majority, you can lose sight of that. Even some of God's greatest servants have made that same mistake. And in verse 2, Paul cites one of those examples. To simply illustrate that if you're not paying close attention, you might start to think God has forgotten his people. He reminds us of the moment of Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, you'd find Elijah very discouraged, very frustrated in his efforts to bring an end to Israel's apostasy. He's been battling an evil king named Ahab and his murderous wife Jezebel. And he's dismayed by what he sees in the nation, this rampant idolatry that's gripping Israel, leading them into apostasy. And his frustrations reach a crisis in chapter 19. And so Elijah runs a great distance away from his hometown to Mount Horeb. That's the mountain where Moses met God during the Exodus. And on that mountain, he demands an audience with God. And when he receives God's presence, he tells God that you might as well take my life. He asks God to kill him because he says, I am the last remaining faithful Jew in all Israel. At which point, God broke out the world's smallest violin. (laughs) He cries out to God. Literally, I am alone, and they will kill me soon too. That's what he says to God. Now, from Elijah's perspective, the nation was already lost. For if he's the last one and they're going to kill me, we're that close to the whole thing thing falling apart anyway. That's his conclusion. So he's saying to God, there's no point in me continuing ministry. Who am I going to minister to? It's just me and you. Take me home. Essentially, Elijah was declaring the same kind of thing that some in Paul's day and some even in our day are declaring concerning Israel, that the nation is lost because we see no evidence of God among them. But in verse 4, Paul reminds us that God works in ways we don't always see, that we're not always privy to. And so we see God's response to Elijah's pity party. The Lord told Elijah... I have kept 7,000 within Israel from bowing their knee to the false god of Ahab, a god called Baal. And there are three important things to notice in God's response. First, the Lord kept a remnant that Elijah knew nothing about. And that is to say, if we take Elijah's words at face value, that he actually did think that he was the last one, it's not just exaggeration, then it means that he had no idea. Notice the verb kept. In what God says, I kept. That verb emphasizes an action on God's part to actively ensure the continuation of faith among Israel. He didn't say, I found 7,000. He didn't say, I have received 7,000. The Lord said, I kept 7,000. Clearly, he was working to assign his mercy to some in Israel so that they would have the faith that saves. Second thing we notice, this group being unknown to Israel, that the prophet believed He was truly alone. He had looked. He had seen only apostasy and unbelief. And yet there were those, in fact, that still knew the Lord. 
the thing is, what the Lord was doing was not powerful. It wasn't prominent. You know, a chapter earlier for Elijah, and he had just called down fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel, and he had impressed the people so much that they were willing to go kill all the prophets of Baal in one fell swoop, right? He probably rolled his sleeves up and said, okay, we're done with this now. Let's move on to, you know, following Yahweh. Next thing he knows, they're right back at Baal worship again without their priests. And his conclusion was that if I don't see the big revival that I'm expecting, God's not here. What God reminds him is, I'm doing my work quietly, and I don't need to tell you every time I do it. And then thirdly, and most importantly, notice the number the Lord preserved from the apostasy. 7,000. And the precision of that number immediately grabs your attention, doesn't it? That's not an estimate. There's no indication in the text that God was rounding up or rounding down. He didn't say about 7,000 or something similar in the text that would clearly suggest to us that this was an approximation. Instead, the Lord gives a precise count of the number of Jews who were still believing in Elijah's day, and that count was exactly 7,000. Not 6,999, not 7,001, but 7,000. And the number 7 is also notable, since 7 is the Bible's number to signify completeness or the whole of something. So we're saying the whole community of faith that remained in Israel was 7,000. So the precision and the specificity of 7,000 can't help but reaffirm the sovereignty of God in his working to choose who would receive his mercy in Israel. There is simply no other way to explain such a precise number, is there? That, that it would work out this way? I mean, either God chose precisely who would believe, or else this is the greatest coincidence in the history of coincidences. And in case you're tempted to vote for coincidence, Paul makes sure you understand that this was no coincidence. In verse 5, he comments on this saying, Elijah's example is proof of how the Lord works to preserve a remnant. He says, in the same way today as what was done in that day, you will find a precise number of Israel preserved from apostasy. And how? By God's gracious choice, not by coincidence, not by happenstance, not by hope and a prayer, but by God choosing. And by his grace, he chooses to save some in Israel. It was this way in Elijah's day. It's this way now. If it's always been by this gracious choice of God, it could never have been by works. Paul says in verse 6, one excludes the other because they're mutually exclusive. And when he says works here, friends, he's referring back to what we learned in chapter 10. Remember in chapter 10, we learned that the Jewish people are pursuing God's mercy by trying to do works of the law. That is to say they were zealous, but they were zealous without a true knowledge of how to obtain salvation. They were trying to work works of law to earn something that didn't come that way. Paul says, if the remnant of believing Israel only comes from God's choice, then it could never have been earned by works. Because even a perfect work of law can't force God's hand. If it's by God's choice and never any other way, then it's always been by grace. What we're learning is the definition of grace. The Jews were barking up the wrong tree, so to speak. They were seeking to be justified by their own works. Meanwhile, the remnant, the 7,000 of Elijah's day and those of our day, are receiving God's mercy as a function of his choice to grant it to them by his grace. So if God allows Israel to receive mercy because of their zealousness, if he ever made that concession, if he were ever to look at Israel and say, you know what, they've been trying so hard for so long, I think I'm just going to go ahead and give it to them because, my goodness, that much effort deserves something. If God ever let that be the way it would be, Paul says he could only do that if he switched the whole method of salvation away from grace and made it all about works. Because he can't mix the two. It's either by his choice or we're earning it. And he says you can't have both ways. It's either going to be one or the other. So if you want God to reward the zealousness of Israel, then what you're voting for is for God to do away with grace for everyone. And then suddenly you're going to all find yourselves in an impossible race to earn salvation. So that either you accept that God chooses those who will receive his mercy, which is the Bible's definition of grace, or... You don't like that? Well, then fine. Then you're going to seek to find God's mercy in your own effort, which is the Bible's definition of works. And what many have done over the course of the history of the church, of course, is combine those two without even realizing it. They've said God's grace only comes after you choose to believe. That's putting a work in the path of God's choice. The Bible reverses that. The Bible says God chooses you, which is why you believe, which is why you confess, 
which is what makes your heart want to do those things. And if it were any other way, if you reverse it, then we're all on the road of works, and who wants that road? He was going to equal the standard God has set for our works. But, of course, we want the Lord to work on the basis of grace. And therefore, we must accept God's sovereignty. We must understand God is choosing to work with only a minority in Israel, at least for now. And that's Paul's conclusion, too, and it leads us to the next question in verse 7. Paul says, well, what then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it. And the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. So that next question, Paul asks, what then? Or we could say, what does all this mean? And Paul explains that the righteousness that Israel is seeking through works of law, it is not obtained because you can't get it that way. The nation as a whole is not righteous. You can see that for yourself now. Righteousness came for them in the person of Jesus Christ and they rejected him. So now, having failed to confess Christ, they've sought it the wrong way and won't obtain it. And the Lord continues to withhold his mercy for them. So Israel continues pursuing righteousness the wrong way, while saving faith continues to be found among the Gentiles. And then in the meantime, Paul says, a minority of Jews, people like Paul himself, were being chosen by God to receive righteousness through faith along the path. These we would call the elect of Israel, the remnant. And they demonstrate that God is continuing to be faithful to the Jewish people. He hasn't turned his back on them, not entirely. They have what they have by God's choice. And nothing demonstrates this better, by the way, than Paul's own conversion story. Think about what you know from the book of Acts for how we know Paul was converted. Paul was literally arrested by Jesus while he's walking on a road. And if you study the three accounts that Paul gives of his, that you read in Acts of his conversion and then Paul's own testimony of his conversion in his writings, you'll notice there's never a moment in which Jesus ever offered Paul a choice of whether to follow him or not. Paul had no choice. Paul was blinded. Paul was told, you're going to suffer for my name's sake, now get up and go. This is not a matter of an altar call. This is a guy who's been arrested by Jesus and told, you're now mine. Paul had it happen in a very um, graphic way, literal way in that sense, but spiritually, that's exactly how we're all saved. The consequences of it, the, the circumstances of it will vary, and if we're not taught properly from Scripture, our memory of it might not be quite accurate. The truth, though, from Scripture is, God chose you and you came to faith as he appointed. But then Paul says, there are those who are pursuing it wrongly, some of which are being saved by God's choice, but the rest, he says, are hardened. Now, the last time we saw Paul use the term hardened was in chapter 9, when he raised the example of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's sinful heart set him against the Lord from the start, from his birth. God didn't create that in him. He inherited that from Adam. But as Paul showed us in chapter 9, the Lord did act to ensure that his heart remained disobedient at a certain point so that he would not give in prematurely. And therefore, knowing how he used the word in chapter 9, we ought to apply a similar meaning to the word here as he describes dealing with Israel. That is to say, Israel initially opposed Christ by their own sinful hearts. God didn't have to do anything to create Israel's unbelief. Unbelief was Israel's natural condition just as it is for all humanity. But Paul says God hardened Israel's hearts to ensure that they continued in their resistance to the gospel. That is to say, they won't give in too soon were there any way for that to happen. And once again, Paul backs his teaching with Old Testament scripture that declares this very truth. The first quote in verse 8 comes from the law, from Deuteronomy, where Moses foretold that God would ensure his people Israel would remain outside his mercy. And Paul paraphrases the verse, so I'm going to go back to the exact wording in Deuteronomy 29. Here's what we read in Deuteronomy 29.2. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, those great signs and wonders. Yet, to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know nor eyes to see, 
nor ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your foot. He goes on from there. You can tell by the context I read, this is happening near the end of the 40 years. This is right before the second generation enters into the promised land. This is the generation that's going to be allowed to go in in contrast to their parents who were barred for unbelief. But right before they enter, Moses addresses them. And he says that even though this young generation had in earlier times seen those same miracles their parents saw, the ones that had been alive at that time, obviously, they'd seen those things. Never mind the miracles they'd seen since then. Shoes not wearing out, food coming down in the form of manna every every day. I mean, you know, come on. After a while, you might get used to it, but it never stops being a miracle, right? They've seen this for 40 years. And he says, nevertheless, this generation was not yet a believing people. How can that be? What earthly explanation would you have for that? It's because they had not been given, by God's hand, the ability to know him, to see him, to hear him. And those things do not come by way of miracles. That's why we call it faith and not by sight. As Jesus says in Luke 16, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even if a man would be risen from the dead. Moses says the answer is the Lord has to give you these things. They have to be appointed to you. And God had not given them hearts yet to know. Now what Moses' words tell us and make abundantly clear is that no one believes unless and until the Lord chooses to bring them mercy. That's his point. That's what he's getting. This is not a sideline issue. This is the issue of chapter 11. Like the generation of Israel that came out of the desert, the Lord has not given our generation of Israel hearts to know him yet. Apart from a small remnant, the rest are hardened. David confirms that conclusion out of Psalm 69. That's Paul's second quotation. David said that, that God should let their table become a snare and a stumbling block. Now, this quote is actually of Jesus. This is a place within the Psalms that is clearly messianic. The words being spoken by David are about himself in the moment, but they are clearly speaking of what Jesus would also know in his day. They speak prophetically of Jesus asking the Father to bring retribution upon those who have crucified him. And so in that context, Israel's table being set refers to the banquet table that opens or inaugurates the kingdom. So when Jesus came to Israel, the table was set, so to speak, for Israel in the sense that Israel could have received the kingdom had they accepted Jesus as their king. It was all set up for them. Instead, they rejected Jesus. So Jesus says through David in the psalm, let their rejection of me because for God the Father to withhold the kingdom from Israel. And in that sense, Jesus' offer of the kingdom became a snare, a trap, a stumbling block, retribution to Israel. What could have been their ticket to the kingdom became just cause for God to withhold the kingdom and keep Israel under judgment. So by David's quote in Psalm 69, we learn that God has purpose to withhold salvation from Israel from the nation as a whole, apart from a remnant, because they rejected Jesus. And this was not a plan that would end in Israel's destruction or crushing or destroying them, as Paul has already explained. This is a plan that has only a limited time to run in the history of Israel. And that's where Paul explains next. This next section of Romans 11, it's especially important to understanding his overall argument, not just in this chapter, but going back to chapter 9. So we're going to have to Look at this next section carefully. And first, and maybe most importantly, as you look at what follows, you need to understand that Paul is talking about nations as he moves through this passage. He's not talking about individual people. That's been the topic all the way back to chapter 9, what God's plan was for a nation, Israel. And then at times, Paul has contrasted that with God's plan for Gentiles as a nation or a group. And we're still in that way of thinking. Israel versus Gentile. We're not at the point of talking about Harry versus Sally. Okay, This is not an individual conversation. So he's comparing God's plan for the Jewish nation with his plan for Gentiles. Let's look at the next section. You'll see this pattern. Verse 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. 
Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. All right, let's start through this now. Verse 11. In this passage, verses 11 through 16, what he's doing, what Paul's doing is reaffirming that Israel still has a special place in God's plan, despite what we see happening with them right now. He asks the question that some might ask, which is, did the Lord allow the nation to stumble in the way that he's described so as to make that nation fall? And of course, by fall, what Paul means is to cease being his people, to disappear, to be forsaken. And of course, the answer is no, we know that. God does not have Israel's destruction in mind, but then he goes on to explain why we know that. He says, the Lord withheld his mercy from Israel for now, for a time, allowing them at first to reject Jesus and then to be set under judgment for doing so and to keep them under that judgment for a period of time. He's done all of that to Israel for a good purpose. What was the good purpose God had in mind for allowing Israel to go through all of that? Uh, the answer is you. You and me. The Gentiles. We Gentiles are now enjoying the Lord's grace, having been given an opportunity to receive his mercy because Israel did not receive it. And in the process, we serve God's purpose by making Israel jealous. And as I said last week, to make Israel jealous in this context, it means in the sense that we stir within the Jewish people a renewed desire for Messiah. We aren't leading them to become jealous of Jesus, nor to agree that he is the Messiah. That's self-evidently not what we're doing to the Jewish people. That's not what Paul means. Nevertheless, our collective declaration that Jesus is our Messiah will serve to strengthen Israel's anticipation and desire for a Messiah. In the same way that when your best friend gets a, a new girlfriend or boyfriend, it makes you kind of wish you had one too, but not theirs. It's the same idea here, that the Jews might potentially have lost all interest in a Messiah by now, if it weren't for the fact that here we are in the world still talking about one all the time. That's the idea. Paul then asks us to consider, well, how is God working in this way for the benefit of the whole world? What's the good that's coming out of this somewhat strange process of one group in and then out and then another group in? What's God trying to accomplish through us? Paul compares the mistake that Israel made with the way God is using it for good. So on the one hand, Israel's rejection of Jesus was a bad thing. Paul calls it a transgression. You notice the word is singular not plural. He's not talking about their sins in general. He's talking about one thing they did. By rejecting Jesus, that transgression, they did something serious that required a response from God. That transgression gave God the just cause to send Jesus to Gentiles instead, which is what we learned in chapter 10. Now, you and I sit here today enjoying the riches that we have in Christ by faith because, and only because, God allowed his own people to sin in that way against his son. He allowed it in the sense that he had the power to stop it. He had the power to bring them to faith, but he chose to leave them in their sin. And in doing so, he made something very good for the world of Gentiles. That's what Paul means when he says that by their transgression, riches came to the world. That's a whole lot of good from a very bad thing. Wouldn't you agree? So if God can use Israel's rejection of Christ... To accomplish very good things for the world, Paul says, well, then let's ask ourselves this. What more good things could come when Israel finally receives Christ? Because if, if good things come from them rejecting him, well, how much more good could come if they receive him? Paul describes that moment in verse, at the end of verse 12 when he says, what would their fulfillment be? He means when God finally fulfills his promises to give Israel the kingdom. That could only happen if and when Israel receives Christ. So what he's saying is, let's think about this from the other side for a second. Israel's receiving Christ will bring about even better things for the world than their rejection was able to bring to us. Well, if their rejection brought us Christ, what's better than Christ now? Only Christ in the kingdom. That's what he's referring to. Now, isn't that an amazing thing to consider? Israel is blessing us regardless of what they do. When they sin against Jesus... It opened the door for us to have Christ. When they finally receive Jesus, it'll bring us even more riches because we get to walk into the kingdom with them. 
doesn't matter what they do, we're going to be blessed as a result. Knowing this, how should we Gentiles then view the people of, of Israel, the Jewish people, during the time that we're in now when they're being set aside for our sake? And I would add, especially, how should we view the unbelieving Jew of our day? Well, Paul explains to us, specifically in verse 13, and he, he prefaces this in my own words. He says, listen up, you Gentiles. Now, he says, I'm an apostle appointed by Jesus to reach the Gentiles. But then he says, even though I was sent to Gentiles, I would magnify my ministry when and if I'm able to reach a particular Jew with the gospel. So remember, Paul was always going to the Jew first. He would go to the synagogues before he would go anywhere else in a city. And in fact, the record of Acts shows that if a town was too small to have a synagogue, Paul didn't stop there at all. Because he went to the Jew first, and there was also a practical concern in that. If you're going to show up in a city that's never heard anything about Jesus, you want a friendly audience. Going to a, Jew, to a synagogue ensured you at least had a group of people that understood from the Old Testament the idea of a Messiah. So he started work there naturally, but he had a conviction that he was sent to the Gentile, but the Jew always had prominence. And so Paul says, though I knew my audience was Gentile, it would only serve to magnify my ministry if I could get a Jew once in a while. And therefore, that's how Gentiles, that's how we should think about Jews as well. We know the nation has been set aside for a time for our sake, but we also know God is still working a plan for their sake that there's still a remnant appointed within the nation of Israel, and that they are God's means of providing mercy to us. So we should seek for the lost Jew, for the remnant that he is seeking to save, because we know that's God's heart for them. Not to the exclusion of Gentiles, not before we talk to another Gentile, just in general, as a part of our ministry, similar to Paul, we ought to be seeking for the Jew when there's opportunity. Because if their rejection of Christ brought us the opportunity to be reconciled, with God, the reconciliation of the world, Paul says, then their acceptance of Christ, Paul says, can bring about the resurrection. In other words, the first coming of Christ brought Israel's rejection, and therefore Israel's acceptance will usher in the second coming. That's the moment of the resurrection of all dead, apart from the church, which will have been resurrected shortly before that. More importantly, it's the start of the kingdom. Daniel teaches us this truth in several places in his book, and so does Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah, that it is the coming of Christ and the start of the kingdom and the resurrection of the Old Testament saints that all coincide within the same moment. So seeking Jews for Christ in compassion and understanding should be the natural response for any Christian who understands God's plan for the world. We stand in Christ because of Israel, and we receive the kingdom only when Israel does. You and I have every reason to treat the nation of Israel, the nation of people of Jews, with respect and to seek their conversion earnestly. And Paul says, if the first piece is holy, so the lump. If the root is holy, so are the branches. What he means here, the lump or the root, they both refer to the beginnings of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, these men of Israel and what covenants God assigned to them. These are the root or the lump of Israel. So let me ask you, do you consider Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be holy, to be good men? Do you think Moses was a worthy servant? Do you think David is worthy of honor? Well, Paul says, you then likewise should consider the nation that God has produced from these men to be equally worthy of honor. Because if the lump was holy, so is any peace that comes out of it. Not because they are individually worthy, not even if they're believing. That has nothing to do with it. Merely because they are God's people, and God has used them to make available everything you have. At hearing this, I know that some Christians probably can't help but call foul and say, well, wait a minute, God's not a respecter of persons, and they may quote other things concerning unbelievers versus believers, and so on. We might question whether it's right to treat such unholy, disobedient people with, with such respect. After all, they crucified Jesus. They spit at the name of Jesus still today. Many of them do. Jews typically, at least historically, have treated Christians with great disdain. And it was even worse in Paul's day, I should add. Jews were persecuting Christians to the point of imprisonment and death in Paul's day. Under those circumstances, it would have been especially hard for someone reading Paul's words to accept the notion that Gentile Christians should continue to hold Jews, especially unbelieving Jews, in such high esteem. But nevertheless, Paul calls the church to set aside those prejudices and anti-Semitism, and hatred for God's people, 
And he warns us of what's coming so that we would have reason to heed his order here. Look at what he says in verse 17. He says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, well, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, again, in this passage, Paul continues to speak in terms of nations, not individuals. If you begin to think that Paul here is speaking in terms of individuals, your theology is going to go really wrong really fast. Because, of course, you'll begin to make bad assumptions about what God is saying concerning an individual's salvation. That's not the topic here at all. Paul is comparing the present generation of Israel, in this analogy, to branches of an olive tree. An olive tree is a classic picture of Israel in the Bible, so that makes sense. Now remember, Paul just said a moment earlier that Israel's origins were a holy lump or a holy root. And so he continues to take the root analogy forward now, and he expands on it. He's extending the metaphor so that he can speak more about the future of Israel. And so the branches of this holy root represent the present Israel that is unbelieving. These are the people that have grown up from the root in terms of their physical descendants. They are the descendants of the patriarchs. They are the heirs of the promises that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But because they did not receive Messiah when he came in fulfillment of those promises, Paul says those branches were cut off. So in Paul's analogy, what does breaking off an olive branch mean? It must picture God setting aside a generation of Israel for their rejection of Jesus. And as we learned, God did so. Why? Well, so that he could make salvation available to Gentiles. And Paul pictures us, the Gentiles, as those wild olive branches grafted into the branchless root after the generation of Israel had been cut off. Now, in Palestine, there's a pretty stark difference between a cultivated olive tree and a wild olive tree. They're easy to see the difference in. You can tell them apart. And naturally, a cultivated olive tree, when it grows, will produce a certain type of branch that is natural to itself, while a wild tree, wild olive tree, produces a different type of branch natural to its nature. And Paul compares us, Gentiles, to unnatural branches put into the root of Israel. We are like something wild that God has grafted into the holy lump of Israel. The point, of course, is that we are not the lump. No more than if you graft in a wild olive branch will it suddenly become natural. It will grow, but it retains its character. It continues to be the, the branch of a foreign tree just living in the root of another tree. Further confirmation that there's no suggestion here that we're replacing anything. We're just attached onto it for a while. We have what we have spiritually because God first made that available to Israel. And we have it now in an unnatural way. That is to say, it wasn't given to us directly. We only have it because God's people don't have it. And that was by God's design. Now, knowing this, Paul says, you and I have no right now, because we understand that, to be arrogant toward those branches who were broken off. If you want to imagine you as that branch grafted in, growing out of this tree, not that you're naturally part of it, you're just stuck into it. And around you on the ground are all the natural branches that should have been where you are, lying there dead, as it were, on the ground. And as you look at those, you might think to yourself, look how you stupid branches didn't get what I got. Look how much better I am than you. Oh, I bet you're wishing you had what I had now. Shame on you for not knowing better, and so on and so forth. Imagine arrogance in any form you wish. And Paul says, knowing this, we can't be that way to the Jews of our day. Whether God chooses to bring those branches faith or not individually, nevertheless, we have no place to treat them arrogantly, as if to suggest we are better than them because we received what they rejected. Now, Paul, to address that particular thought, because that's the nucleus of the thought, right? If you're ever arrogant about somebody in this context, it's only because you think you have something they should have figured out 
and somehow you're inherently better than them because you got it. Paul says, remember, who's the root in this arrangement? Who's holding you up, he says, so to speak. So if you treat an unbelieving Jew with disrespect, especially if it includes harboring anti-Semitic views, you're forgetting that that person's unbelief was ordained for your sake. Let that sink in for a second. They're unbelieving because God ordained it so that you would have what you have. In verse 19, Paul suggests that some Christians might conclude, well, God cut them off so that I could be in their place. In other words, Paul's making the argument of replacement theology there in verse 19 so that he can defeat it. That the church has replaced Israel in God's plan, and therefore we have no reason to give special consideration to Jewish people anymore. And I would tell you that those I know who hold the view of replacement theology, they aren't necessarily arrogant people, but they have a certain haughtiness with respect to Israel. They pay them no attention, give them no consideration, have no interest in them, for they view them as just another people group on the earth with no special distinction any longer. That is the definition of arrogance in this context. They are yesterday's news as far as the replacement theologian is concerned, but not as far as God is concerned. To this, Paul responds in verse 20 by saying, yes, they were cut off for your sake. But then Paul adds, but remember, you're standing by your faith. And this is what Paul means. The Gentile church has what it has merely because God decided you should have it. He decided to shift his mercy toward you so that by faith you would receive his righteousness. Remember, we've already learned that we have his righteousness not because we were looking for it, but because God elected that we should receive it. So Paul is warning the replacement theologian, do not be so conceited in your view of Israel because you should fear God, because God's pattern should be very clear for you by now. And in verse 21, Paul says, if God was willing to set his own people aside for a time, then you probably should anticipate that he's going to do the same thing for Gentiles at some point. Now remember, Paul's talking here in terms of groups, not individuals. Paul's alluding to what's coming for the world and for Israel. There was a day in the past when the natural branches were at the center of God's attention. There was a day when God cared only for Israel. All that he did was for Israel. All that he spoke was to Israel. All that he covenanted was with Israel. There was only one nation that was in God's favor. And in that day, the Gentile nations were subject to Israel's power and to Israel's prestige. When God wanted his people to have the promised land, for example, the Canaanites were persona non grata. God said, take them away, all of them. When God wanted to free his people, Egypt and Pharaoh were collateral damage. That was a day that used to be. But when God elected to cut off those natural branches and to make room for the unnatural branches so that they may share in the good things that God once gave to Israel, well, then everything got turned upside down. Israel was trampled, dispersed, persecuted, held under judgment for centuries, kept outside their land. Meanwhile, Gentile nations rose great and powerful in the world. As God desired to bless other nations, he sacrificed his own people. But that's not the end of the story. Paul says, we know God has a kingdom on earth that is planned, that will come. And the scriptures are explicit. It says the son of God, Messiah, will rule in that coming kingdom from the seat of David in the temple of Jerusalem. Scriptures say that in this kingdom to come, Israel will once again be the chief nation among all nations on the earth. It even says that all Gentile nations in the kingdom will serve and honor the Jewish nation in that kingdom time that we know is coming. So think about it. Paul directs your attention to that day when Israel will once again be in the driver's seat and we will not. And he asks us to consider that day and he asks us to ask ourselves, how do you think God is going to deal with us in our time in the kingdom, when he knows we spent our time here on earth arrogant toward his own people while they were being put under subjection for our sake. When they have become our masters in the kingdom, and we are Israel's servants, as scripture says we will be, will we wish we had thought twice about our prejudice toward the Jewish people? That's what Paul means when he says a believer who has this arrogant view of Israel ought to fear he says, until this whole thing is written and the, and the song is sung and we see the final state of life on earth in the kingdom, we ought not be too presumptuous to assume what God's plan is for his own people. 
as I like to say, what goes around comes around. Then in verse 21, Paul reveals that if God was willing to set his own people aside for a time, then it's only natural to expect that one day he's going to do the same for Gentiles, that in a day to come, God's mercy toward Gentiles will come to an end. And in that moment, he'll turn his attention back to his own people. And in that day, Gentiles will be cut off, just as Jews have already been cut off. And again, we're not talking about individual people going in or out of salvation. That's not the topic. That's not even a biblical notion. Paul's talking about nations moving in and out of God's favor in his plan for the whole world. In summary, Paul asks us to contemplate the kindness and severity of God. In the same way that God cut off his people Israel and welcomed us, the likes of us, into his mercy, that's showing severity to one for the kindness of other, to, to the other. Paul says in verse 22, that state is not permanent. The opposite is also true. Gentiles should not depend on God's mercy being available forever. Because in a day to come, he's going to shift back to Jews so that he may fulfill his promises to them eventually. And in that day, we're cut off. We see severity. They see kindness. In fact, he says they'll be grafted right back into their own root. And by the way, if you think that's a tough thing to consider, what's easier? Grafting strangers into the root or grafting the natural into the root? Ironically, that was the stumbling block for many covenant theologians. Many of the reformed leaders were replacement theologians, unfortunately. But their stumbling block was trying to imagine a way or a day or time in which Israel could ever reemerge on the scene as a nation, a nation of people observing their law and serving their God. It would seem so remotely possible, so incredible, that they sought for a better way to explain God's word, better in their mind. And yet Paul says, plainly, you find that hard to accept that God could graft his own people back in? That's harder to accept that he would graft in strange people? It only makes sense that he can do it. But if God's willing to offer salvation to a people who are not his people, how much more should we expect him to offer salvation to the people who are his people? As we prepare to finish the chapter, here's what you know. God dispenses his mercy as he chooses. Historically, God has selected only a minority of Israel to receive his mercy. And when the time came for Israel to get their Messiah, they rejected him because of their hard hearts. God gave Israel the message that salvation was by faith. He gave it to them early. He gave it to them often. Yet they stubbornly refused to accept God's word. They preferred to seek their own righteousness by law. Moreover, God did not give that nation a heart to know and receive Christ. And he didn't do it because it was judgment for their sin. He left them in their sins, allowing their sinful hearts to go their own way, which ultimately resulted in their rejecting and crucifying Christ. But that was God's plan. To set his people aside so that he could fulfill his promises to Abraham when he said he would bring his mercy to all nations. So today, his mercy is going out to all nations because of Israel's rejection of Christ. Meanwhile, God's hardened their hearts to leave them outside his mercy for a time. In the meantime, we Gentiles are receiving God's mercy. But for that very reason, we can't look arrogantly upon those God has set aside. In the meantime, how can you look upon Israel with contempt, knowing they were left unbelieving so that you might receive mercy? It's a humbling truth. It should leave you with great sympathy for the Jewish people. So all that remains now for us to understand is how in the end will God wrap all these loose strings, all these loose ends up so that his people do finally get what he's promised to give them? That's what we hear next, Romans eleven twenty five. He says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is a powerful section of Paul's letter, but it's very brief on detail. And as a teacher, I had the challenge here of trying to decide how deep do I go. Well, I'll save you any worries. I'm not going to go that deep. Most of the details that Paul is basing his teaching on are details found in other scripture. And time just doesn't let us get into it all here. You can... Get all of those details in other studies, like the Revelation study that I have online. But I'm just going to follow Paul as he teaches here, using his summary. And it begins with Paul's preface in verse 25. Paul is preparing you here to receive a mystery. He says, I want you to know of this mystery, or not to be uninformed of this mystery. A mystery in the Bible is a technical thing. It's not just a general word that means something you don't know. There are eight mysteries revealed in the New Testament. A mystery is a truth that had existed before and is seen in the Old Testament, but until it was revealed in the New Testament, no one knew what it meant. No one saw it until it was revealed. 
One of those eight mysteries is the one that Paul reveals here. Of the eight in the New Testament, Paul reveals four of them in his letters. The one that Paul reveals here has to do with Israel's future. Paul says, unless you understand this mystery that he's going to reveal, you're likely to think of yourself as wise, but only in your own estimation. We might be tempted to think that we know what God is doing with Israel and with us, the church. In reality, that wisdom is in our eyes only because we lack this critical piece of information. And I think, once again, Paul's alluding to the people who might hold replacement theology, people who believe the church has replaced Israel. It's a partial truth because it understands God's pattern up to the point of their rejection of Jesus at the first coming, but that's where their understanding stops, and so they miss the rest of the story, and so they begin to try to explain Israel's current situation as a permanent outcome. Paul says, let me give you the rest of the story. The hardening that Israel has experienced since Christ is, Paul says, partial, and it's temporary. It's partial because it still allows for a remnant. There is still a small number of believing Jews. That never ceases to exist. So though God is hardening Israel, he's not hardening all of them. He's hardening most of them. Remember, that's important because all by itself, that proves, the remnant proves that God is not done with his people. Why would he go to such an effort to keep at least some people believing if it weren't for the fact that he still had a plan for Israel? Secondly, though, Paul says this hardening is temporary. It's not going to last forever. It ends, Paul says, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. The term fullness is a Greek word that can be translated the full count. So when God has reached the full count of Gentiles that he intends to save, then he will be ready to return his attention to Israel. At that point, then, the hardening of Israel will come to an end. And the nation will receive God's mercy so as to believe in Jesus, just as we now have been given that mercy as well. This is yet another clear statement of God's sovereignty in salvation, that he appoints a certain number of people to believe within the Gentile church. You could say this, just as God had a certain number of Jews in mind for the remnant, as in 7,000 for Elijah's day, for example, similarly, God has a certain number of Gentiles in mind for salvation throughout the age. And just as that Jewish remnant was small relative to the overall number of Jewish people, so it will be that Gentiles who receive mercy will be a relatively small number compared to the overall number of Gentiles who walk the earth. The path is narrow, as Jesus would say. Paul quotes Old Testament scripture to prove that God has foretold these very things, though they remained hidden until Paul reveals them here in this mystery. In verse 26, Paul quotes from the very end of Isaiah 59. That chapter in Isaiah 59 and the one that follows, chapter 60, describes the circumstances that surround Christ's second coming and the start of his kingdom. So it's set in that end-of-the-age, apocalyptic, Jesus-returning, kingdom-coming moment. Okay, Put yourself in that moment. In the midst of those events, Isaiah says, the Lord promises to send Jesus from Zion. Now that can't be the Zion that we commonly think of, the one that's on earth, the one in Jerusalem. That's the Zion of heaven. That's the heavenly Zion. That's a reference then to him coming from heaven, from above, a second coming. And why does he come back? Notice the purpose. He comes back for the purpose of removing ungodliness from Jacob. Now, Jacob's another name for Israel. So it stands here for the name of the nation. So what do we just learn? Now, remember, this has been in Isaiah for centuries. At his second coming to earth, Jesus removes all ungodliness from a nation of people. The nation of Jews who are alive on earth at the second coming of Christ will all be saved by faith in Jesus. That's a dramatic turn from the situation that you find today, isn't it? It's exactly what Paul has been telling us would happen. It's not just that he removes the hardening. He removes the hardening, he softens up the heart, he puts faith in it, and they're done. One day, his mercy returns to his own people in a big way. He doesn't just save a remnant in the future, he saves everyone. And notice how Paul opens verse 26. He says, And so all Israel will be saved. Every single Jew receives mercy in that future day to come. Now, we're not talking about all Jews who've ever lived. We're talking about all Jews who are alive on that day. And you can see this moment described vividly in Zechariah. I've read this passage many times in past teachings. I won't teach on it. Let me just read it. You'll see it for yourself. This is Zechariah set in the very same period of time. Second coming about to happen. End of tribulation. The world you know, torn apart. And then we hear in Zechariah 12:9. In that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit 
of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. And in that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadadrimmon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, and the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves. All the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. He leaves no one out, in other words. So we're talking here about the same moment that Isaiah was talking about earlier. Zechariah says how all Israel will be saved, just as Paul promises. And that is how? Mass evangelism? A revival tent? Delusion? Coincidence? The Spirit of God poured out on His people so that they will look upon Him whom they pierced and mourn for Him like they mourn for an only child. Notice Zechariah says, all the families that remain on earth will be saved in this way. All Israel. Here again, you cannot explain that kind of an event happening exactly that way in any way except by God's sovereignty. Since there are no exceptions to how it happens, you have to acknowledge that's a moment that is not determined by will, by choice, by feelings, by thought, by conviction. It has to have been by God's will in keeping with his promises to Israel or it's unexplainable otherwise. Here again, the biggest coincidence in all coincidences. Just as Isaiah says in verse 27, this act of mercy is God keeping his covenant with them to save them and to bring them into the kingdom, just as he promised, being faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. And he also reiterates this in the Mosaic covenant in Leviticus 26. But he has delayed the fulfillment of these things long enough to extend mercy to a certain number of Gentiles, to you and to me. That number hasn't been reached yet. We haven't reached the fullness of the Gentiles yet, self-evidently. But one day, when it is reached, then God will move his mercy from Gentiles back to Israel. Paul summarizes this in verses 28 through 32. We'll do this next week and then end with Paul giving this crescendo of praise to the Lord for the wisdom of this plan. I want to end here just for time's sake, but also because in that summary and transition, we'll have a chance to move out of what we've been doing for three chapters now and back into the mainstream of teaching that we left back at the end of chapter 8. So that's what we'll do when we come back. Let's go to prayer. Uh, Dear Father, open our ears and our, our hearts and minds to consider what we've heard tonight in new ways. Father, I may be wrong, as any teacher could be, Father, for we teach according to the limits of our knowledge, and where we depart from you, Father, we depart from the truth. But, Father, your word seems plain, and you've written it for our understanding, so we know that if we do not understand it, it's not for the lack of clarity in your word, Father. It's only because we choose not to because our ears are closed, because our eyes are not willing to see, uh, because, Father, we are not ready yet to accept things. But, Father, in your love and mercy, you don't reject us because we don't understand. You don't cease loving us because we don't uh, follow all that you give us, Father. And as Jesus said, Father, you have hidden these things from the wise of the world, and you have revealed them to infants. But infants need time to digest, Father. So give us that time. Help us to understand. Help us to know and see how a loving God has made this plan the way it is, for there could be no better way. And we thank you, Father, more than all, more than anything, for the mercy we've received, a mercy we did not deserve. But you appointed to us merely because of your grace. We thank you for that, Father, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.